and the first pirate woman to ever serve as chief spokesperson of the Pentagon. You know who the chief spokesperson is? But Dana, where's that star of David wherever she goes? Dana White. And there's a Christian lover of Israel, and there is no bigger lover of Israel in the entire United States, including Jonathan Garibas. Oh, the girl. Which doesn't mean much because you're from Israel. She just had an anti-Semitic attack against her in the Boston Logan Airport where she was attacked for wearing a mother mother. So now, for the introduction to Jonathan Marigas, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, what an honor, straight from Washington, D.C., the former chief international spokesperson of the United States military, Canada White. The Palestinian up here before he performs. It was so nice. He just performed really well. Yeah, there's a fight. There's a fight. No, we have an incident. You know, that's the way it goes. Because these people don't just hate Israel. When I say the U.S. military, that's when they got They hate America, so we apologize. We want it. There's a fight over here. Hospital. And there he struck up a friendship that would have a lasting impact 
on multiple generations. His name was Dr. William Goodwin, and he was the head of the University of Virginia Hospital. Now we have to remember this was the 1930s, so Dr. Goodwin wasn't necessarily loud about his Jewish heritage. But my grandfather always referred to him fondly and knew that he was Jewish. Yeah. I imagine they became friends over sharing old soldier stories because Dr. Woodwin had also served at the U.S. Army as a lieutenant colonel. And he learned of my grandfather's service and that he'd earned his high school diploma and Dr. Goodwin promoted my grandfather. He promoted him to the head of housekeeping, which meant that he was responsible for hiring all the maids, all the cooks, all the janitors, all the orderlies for a University of Virginia hospital, which meant most blacks in Charlottesville owed their first job to my grandfather. Dr. Goodwin would never see how much my grandfather would accomplish and what his single decision started. He died of a, of, a, of a heart attack suddenly in 1937. But my grandfather went on to lead another department at the university, the respiratory therapy department, invented a special valve and sold the patent to the U.S. Navy. And he went on to go went on to be the publisher of the Charlottesville Album Mall Tribune that was for, and he ran it for over 50 years and it was the oldest black run newspaper in Virginia. My grandfather was a firm believer in education and he sent my father to Howard University where he met my mother and married. And I stand here before you in large part, thanks to the decision of a Jewish doctor nearly 100 years ago. When, that, when the rabbi asked me to come and speak, in addition to introducing Jonathan, who really needs no introduction because we see him all the time. I've seen him like four times just today. Um, I wanted to do three things. One, I wanted to honor all Americans past and present who wear our nation's fall. Thank you. And our allies, our strongest allies in the Middle East, the Israeli Defense Forces. Who fight every day for our rights, our principles, and most of all, for our Judeo-Christian values. Number two, I'm also here to pay tribute to all of you. As a black, God-fearing, Jesus-loving Christian, I want to say thank you for being you. Thank you for being who you are. What I've always admired about Judaism is that it's ethos, it's ethos to make the world better. In my community, we often talk about giving back and bringing people along, and that's great. But you see, within this community, there's this desire to give forward. You see, Dr. Goodman, he didn't help my grandfather. My grandfather was smart. He earned his diploma. He served his country. Dr. Goodwin didn't help my grandfather. He recognized my grandfather. He saw my grandfather. Because, let's face it, when we help someone, 90% of it is about us. How we feel, how it makes us look. But Dr. Goodwin recognized someone. When you recognize someone, you respect them. And that's what he did. And as a result, my grand, his, my grandfather's granddaughter became the first black spokesperson of the United States military. There's a third thing. I also want to say, it is written in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, I will make you a light 
for the nations, that you might bring salvation to the ends of the earth. You are the light of the world, and I am so sorry that the world is so dark right now. I'm sorry that my friend's daughter was threatened because she wore her star faded in this city. I'm sorry, and I'm ashamed. But I want you to know that you're not alone. You've never been alone, and you never will be alone. I know you know who you are, but I also just want to remind you of whose you are. Thank you for being you, because had God not chosen you, I would never have had the chance to choose him. Israel remains a beacon of hope, freedom, and prosperity in a region hostile to our shared values. You are a light unto nations and the apple of God's eye. And we all know God always wins. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce retired Lieutenant Colonel, former IDF spokesperson, and senior defense fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, Jonathan Cornicus. important cities in the world, our capital, our internal capital, Jerusalem. What an honor for someone who grew up there or was born there to come to New York, to be speaking in Times Square, to look around and to see a sea of beautiful people who come here with love, not with hatred, who come with strength and unity, who come with passion and who are here with energies of love and of good. Not of hatred, but of love for Israel, yearning for peace, and who are here to say words of strength and of love. I want to start by thanking Rabbi Boteach for organizing this event. Rabbi Boteach staff, Gabi, who has been working tirelessly behind the scenes. And I want to thank the men and women of the NYPD for keeping us safe and for allowing us to be here in this beautiful city that was built also with Jewish sweat and toil that became so great with Jewish actions. And we are here today because Jews over the time earned a place to stay here and speak. Because Jews built this city and it is right for us to be here and stand and speak and be proud. Do 
New York is a city that symbolizes imagination, that symbolizes creativity, that symbolizes initiative and action. And all of these things are the same in Israel. Israel is a miracle amongst nations. It is a small country that up until a few years ago only had one resource to, to put to the table and that is our human resource, the people that we have and that we are blessed with. And it, this, and it is this people today that sadly is fighting. We are fighting for our survival against the very same people that are represented on the other side of the street whose message is hatred, where our message is love. And what we are here to say today is that just as the brave men and women of the IDF who are fighting as we stand here in New York City in Times Square, they are fighting to keep Israel safe. What we are saying is that we are fighting here to preserve our way of life and to be proud where we live. We are not going to allow them to tell us what clothes to wear. We are not going to allow them to tell us which jewelry to have. And we are not going to allow them to dictate to us if we go to shul or if we don't. Which school we send our kids. And we are not going to allow them to say and dominate the American campuses or the American streets. We are here. You are here. I'm not an American, but you are here as proud American patriots who claim to be proud and free and safe in your country. Now, I just came from Israel a few days ago, and the situation in Israel is not an easy one. The people are fighting, and the burden of fighting is heavy. Israel is fighting on seven fronts simultaneously. We're fighting different faces of one enemy. Different people that are being used by a cynical, tyrannic regime, by a regime that has no love for their own people and no respect for human life, and that is the evil Iranian regime. And we are fighting a war that we did not start and we did not want. It was forced upon us by these savages on October the 7th when they came across into Israel, murdered our men, our women, our children, our elderly, our Holocaust survivors, when they did some of the most atrocious things that only are remembered in the Holocaust or in horrible movies presented by ISIS. And every day that went by, and I was fighting in international media, being bombarded with relentless questions and pressure that was aimed to weaken our resolve and weaken my resolve as a spokesperson, at the end of every day, I used to watch the videos and hear the testimonies of our people and what they endured. I watched the bodies and I heard the testimonies and I saw the cry and the tears of the families of our 115 hostages that are still in captivity that need to be brought back home. Yes, bring them home. Hamas, release them. I saw these videos of Hamas's atrocities, it reminded me what we are fighting. And 10 months after the war started, by their acts of aggression, unprovoked aggression against us, I'll tell you some, finally some good news. If you were to come to the Gaza Strip today, and you were to look for Hamas commanders or Hamas soldiers, and if you were to search for their rockets or their fighters, you wouldn't find them. You know why? Because the IDF has been kicking the shit out of them. That 
is what the IDF has been doing. Despite relentless pressure, despite relentless pressure against Israel, despite so many countries of the world teaming up against Israel, instead of supporting us, they're limiting our ability to defend, to defend ourselves. Despite all that, the IDF keeps its eye on the goal and they are fighting and they are winning. IDF, honor them, honor the IDF. Now, it has taken longer than what we wanted. Ten months of fighting is a very long time. Ten months of captivity for our 150 remaining hostages is ten months too long. And every day that goes by, our people suffer. Our brothers and sisters from northern Israel who have been evacuated from their homes, pushed away by Hezbollah rockets and missiles, and are now being forced to resettle, not in their homes, because they are killed and fired upon by Hezbollah, are suffering. Our regular service soldiers, some of them represented here by our brave friends who came back from service. Yes, give them a hand. Our brave soldiers are fighting like lions. They are not afraid because they look back and they see the lights of Israel and they know exactly why they are fighting. They are fighting to defend our homeland, our people, their mothers and brothers and fathers. That is why they are fighting and they need no explanation why they need to fight. So it is difficult and they are fighting and they will continue to fight. Now. I see from afar and I meet Jewish communities. For the last half year, I have been traveling all across America and Canada. I have been visiting Europe, both North, Central and South. And I've spoken to so many Jewish communities and spoken to so many Jews around the world. And I am sad to see how afraid and terrorized they are. So many Jews around the world who are loyal, beautiful, law-abiding citizens in their countries, who pay their dues, who pay their taxes, who honor their monuments, feel threatened in their homes. And this is something that we cannot tolerate. And when Rabbi Shmuley told me, come to New York City and let's do a rally to support Israel in the center of what has become the epicenter of anti-Semitism, I said yes. We come here, and we fight back, and we take a stand, and we say, no, we are small in numbers, but we are great in faith. We are small in numbers, but we are mighty, and we are proud. And we are not going to let you to take America's streets, and we are not going to let you to take American campuses, and we will not be bullied, and we will not be cowered into submission because we are proud and we are Jews. And that is why I came here today, to bring you some love and strength and chutzpah and belief and faith straight from Israel. Now I see hatred on American campuses. I see people who live in America who were brought up in the comfort and prosperity that freedom and democracy give them, and they come to rallies, they desecrate American monuments, they espouse and provide support for Hamas and Hezbollah, they wave their banners and they chant their genocidal slogans aimed at Israel, and they think that they are on the right side of history. But let me tell you something. They are on the wrong side of history, they are fools and they are misled, and they will be defeated. And when I see Jewish children bullied on their way to school, and parents who cannot safely go to work because they are afraid 
what will happen to their children on the way to synagogue, I am worried. I am concerned that we need to protect ourselves and arm ourselves and fight in order to lead our normal lives. But if that is what it takes, then that is what we will do. Now, this 24 hours have been some mighty interesting 24 hours. For the first time in a long time, months, our excellent, calculated, professional and moral IDF has delivered blows to our enemies that they will reel from for months. And what the IDF has done over less than 24 hours is to deal Maybe a devastating, but definitely a strong blow against three of our enemies. Not one, not two, but three of our enemies. And not only did we take out enemy military commanders who were actively leading combat against Israel, who were guilty of firing rockets towards Israel, who were responsible for killing 12 children in Israel. Not only did we do that in Beirut, but we also delivered a strong and unequivocal message to Iran. We did so, the IDF did so. The IDF hasn't recognized it, so we'll have to be careful with our words. But the IDF did an important deed. And that was to send a message to Iran that even in their capital, even when all of the terrorists in the world come together and honor their Iranian masters, stay with me folks, stay with me. Even when they come together yeah. in Iran, they are not safe. The long arm of the IDF reaches them in their capital of terror. In respect of what the NYPD has asked us to do, and that is to bring this event, this beautiful event, to a peaceful, respectful close, I will tell you this, looking forward. To be perfectly clear, and some people are wavering in their faith, and some people are buckling at their knees because it's been a long, difficult war, but I'm here to tell you that Israel is strong, that Israelis are strong, that the mothers and fathers and grandparents are strong, and that they are protecting their soldiers and they're telling the soldiers, go on, keep on fighting, get the job done, and the IDF will get the job done. But what is victory? What does victory mean? Does it mean killing the enemy? Does it mean taking away their tunnels and rockets and explosives? It means that, but it means much more. Victory to me, just like we've said here before, is not about death, it's about life. Victory to me will be when all of you can come back home to Israel, when you will come down to the kibbutz